so tonight we are going to begin with a reading from Psalms, chapter 37, verses 23 through 24. And it says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. So, uncertainty. It's a pain. Despite the fact that we've witnessed God's handiwork time and time again, at the end of the day, when the pressure is on, we are looking at the behemoth that stands in front of us when we should be looking at the one who will slay the beast. We know it will come. We know that this suffering is only temporary and that God's glory will shine out through the blessings that are bestowed. Yet we fall prey to this trap every time. We're enthralled with the problems that we are embroiled in instead of expectantly seeking the deliverance that our Lord will provide. But tonight, let's talk about a clueless character that comes to discover that he is what is known as a dragonborn. Yes, we are looking at our character from the Elder Scrolls Skyrim. And as it is so eloquently stated on the load screen of the game, Skyrim, legend tells of a hero known as the Dragonborn, a warrior with the body of a mortal and soul of a dragon, whose destiny it is to destroy the evil dragon out of it. And this great hero, this slayer of dragons that is to come and rid the world of this evil, begins his journey in chains as a lowly prisoner. And if you're not careful, your tune that you spent 45 minutes getting just right will be named that, and you'll have to start the whole process over. But that's not important. What is important is that you are on your way to the chopping block. We don't know what crime we've committed to deserve this, and apparently neither do the guards, because our name was not even on the list to be executed. But thankfully, they were able to pencil us in anyways, because hey, Skyrim logic. But all around, it's a pretty unfair situation, as we draw the short end of the stick. While we know that our character isn't going to die off this quick, let's look at it from his perspective. He's about to die, when really, he shouldn't even be here. And the Imperials are not nice. They make you watch your executioner as he raises and lowers the axe. But suddenly, right before the axe is about to come down, boom! Alduin, that evil dragon we talked about earlier, shows up to the party and throws everything into chaos, allowing our character to make his escape, and so the story begins. Trials are imminent in our lives. They're going to challenge us and attempt to break us as we are focused on the ax coming down instead of the smaller details that are accumulating into something revolutionary. When we follow after Jesus, we are following a path that many do not understand. We are born of water and spirit and the fires of the enemy may attempt to consume us and we may feel the heat and the pressure that they cause. But the flames of the enemy are weak and unable to harm us. For this pressure that is used in hopes to derail us will only create in the followers of Jesus a perseverance that even if we stumble seven times, we will get back on our feet because our God is alive and with us and we have nothing to fear in this world. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We are to praise God when life is perfect, just as we are to sing his praise when we are overcome by devastation. We know that God will neither abandon nor leave us, and even though we are presently in the shadow of the beast, we know that to stand in a shadow means that there is a source of light coming up behind what we face. Let's hop into scripture for the night, and we'll begin with John chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And this is gonna bring us to our first point. The severity of the problem 
that we face is dependent on our faith in Jesus. Now, let that just sink in for a second. What I'm saying is our troubles, whether it's finances, work, relationships, health, oppression, I don't care. They will wax and wane based on our faith in Jesus. If our view of Jesus is small, our problems will overwhelm us as we fight to keep our heads above water. This foundation is shaky and has no roots to weather the storm. However, when we trust that Jesus is the great I am, our problems are trivial because we know in the end, we will claim the victory. Is Jesus only capable when you are getting everything you want, but when disaster strikes, you can't be bothered to pray because he doesn't care? Surely not. My God is God of the impossible, and there is nothing that we face that he has not seen and prepared a way for us. He already knows what he is going to do before we even ask. But when our focus is somewhere else, we're going to miss the exit ramp that God throws up for us to take. If our view of Jesus is lacking, our anxiety and problems will rule our lives. Because if our view of Jesus is lacking, then we have not given him lordship over our lives. And this brings us to the second point. What we lack is made up for by Jesus. John 6 verses 8 through 11. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. As humans, we would see the crowd of people and what we have on hand for sustenance and know that we're in trouble. But where we lack, Jesus will make up the difference. Take a look at our scripture. Granted, I am not the best at math, but I'm pretty sure that a group of people numbering in the thousands is definitely greater than five loaves and two fish. I'm pretty sure of that. Look, I'm not even going to pretend to tell you I understand how this happened, but that's the thing about Jesus. I don't need to understand it. He's the Lord of all, creator of the earth, alpha and omega. Everything that we see, everything that we have belongs to him. This is why this crowd of thousands did not leave hungry, empty, or wanting. They ate their fill because it was not by anything that they had done, but because instead of trying to fix the problem, they were focusing on the solution. Where there is less of you, there is more God, and that's what's required to overcome anything. And number three, we have to submit all that we have to Jesus. It does not matter if we feel what we have is inadequate. That's not what's important. What's important is that you submit everything you do have, even if that's not a lot, to God. We can't continue living this life of only giving God what's His when we have time or the ability to. We should never be okay with only giving God our leftovers or our good enoughs. We must have the faith to trust Him with every aspect of our life. What we perceive as meager, God can take and make bountiful. John 6, verses 12 through 13. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. There were leftovers off of five loaves and two fish. Just wrap your head around that. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. But this takes faith, and let's be honest, sometimes what we see happening does not look like a blessing. And this is a crucial period of our walk as we learn what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Back to our character in Skyrim for just a moment. Let's recap. He was a prisoner, taken to be executed, the big evil dragon attacked, you made your escape. You're all cut up. While it makes for an entertaining video game, this would be awful to live through. But here's where it gets good. It's because you were a prisoner sentenced to death that you escaped into the land of Skyrim. It's because you escaped that you were able to make your way to Whiterun and help Jarl Balgroth with the growing threat of the dragon's return. Because of this, you join his housecarl, Irlith, 
and go to face your first dragon, which after defeating, you absorb, allowing you to unlock the ability to shout your first thune. And this is still only the beginning of the game. There's more adventure and experiences to come, but for us to reach the end goal, the first event, being a prisoner, had to take place. It's a chain of events. We can't go halfway and turn back, and we can't start at the end and just reap the benefits. We commit to where we are being led, and when we arrive where God leads us, we will come to see his glory as we realize, though it may have been rough, this refinement was necessary for us to receive a blessing as well as become prepared for the next leg of the journey. The crowd is loud and obnoxious but we can't allow it to distract us. While the crowd is asking questions and wondering what they'll do for food, Jesus is right in front of them performing miracles. Look, I don't know what's on your plate. I don't know what your crowd looks like. And I don't know the chain of events that led you to your predicament. But whether you're standing in fire or just dipping water, you are not walking this difficulty alone. Jesus already knows what the plan for you is but you're going to swim in your troubles until you realize that you need to call on the name of Jesus. Walk by faith, trust in him, and don't go halfway through your journey just to stop and turn around. These trials are there to build perseverance that we may lack in nothing, but they also provide us the opportunity to witness blessings and miracles as Jesus shows up and turns everything upside down. And our world quest for this week is, what are we focusing on? And does it deserve to have our attention or concern? Be honest and pray about it. You may be walking in circles, but Jesus will lead you to the next leg of your journey.